Good morning, Axe family. It's your kids pastor, Cecily, here again to give you some announcements. Sunday, August 20th is our graduation day for our kids. Any child who attends children's service who is moving up to a new grade level can move up to their new grade level classroom on this Sunday. We will have popsicles out in the front parking lot after church available for your kids to celebrate their new school year. Hey parents, did you know that the prayer room is being open for you? If your little ones are feeling a little bit wiggly and giggly or just a little bit fussy on Sunday mornings, the prayer room is an open space for you to take them during service. The Sunday morning 242 group is starting again on August 20th at 9.30 in the upstairs adult education room. Laren and Kara Silver are our leaders. If you've been looking for a Sunday morning Bible discussion, this could be it. If you'd like more information, please check the church app or the website. If you're new here, we are so happy to have you and we would love for you to stop by the welcome desk as soon as service is over to pick up a little gift from us and to get connected. We're so glad that you're here and we cannot wait to spend time with you this morning. Amen. Good morning. So I think it's been, I'm not sure how many months now that we've been taking communion every Sunday, and I just want to encourage you, we did not forget. We're just moving it to the end of the service today, so I'm sure some of you are like, we forgot communion. We didn't forget. We just moved it around a little bit this morning. Um, before I get into the word, I uh, just want to acknowledge a few people. Uh, Hannah, is Hannah, I know I saw her, Hannah Coker, where are you at? Stand up, Hannah Coker and Cynthia Fay, and Joseph, where's Joseph? Is he in the kids' room? So these guys have just spent um, six weeks, over six weeks really, overseas with our team in the Caucasus in Muslim villages, uh, reaching people. So glad you guys, poor guys, man. It, it, flights got canceled like crazy. It took them like four days to get home. Spent a lot of time in the airport. So, uh, but glad you guys are back. I'm proud of you. Um, yeah, let's pray. Jesus. How many of you guys need Jesus? Do you realize, man, I need him right now. Jesus, we need you. Thank you for the encouragement to build our life on you. That's what we want to do. Holy Spirit, we ask you to come and just continue to transform us open up the word that it would convict us, challenge us, bless us, give us, you know, at the same time a tear and, 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 a, and a smile, Lord. Lord, we bless you. We need you. We love you. It's in your son's beautiful, amazing name we pray. Amen. Amen. Um, I asked Sharia, how do I sound out there to you guys? Good? Okay. I asked Sharia if she would sing uh, Honey in the Rock this morning. I remember the first time I ever heard that song, I was like, what is it talking about? Like, what is that referring to? And it took me going back, reading it, uh, and really kind of studying the song and the words of it to realize all of us. I went from like, what is that talking about? To man, I love this song. It's a song I listen to many mornings uh, in my, my time with the Lord. Um, it's talking about, you know, ultimately that Jesus is the rock, Right? Like we are to build our lives on him. When it's talking about, there's amazing, beautiful verses throughout Scripture that are talking about this rock. The rock is prophesied of in the Old Testament. We'll read some of those verses. And then it comes to fulfillment in, in Christ in the New Testament. And um, I prayed a minute ago that, that you know, are you, do you need Jesus? And then saying that I need him. It, it is the recognition that he is the cornerstone. He is the rock. He is the foundation. And we are to build our lives on him. And this morning, I want to ask you, is your life built truly on Jesus? Um, is he the first one you go to? Is he the first one you're listening to? Or is, is, he, is he, you know, is the foundation, is everything else kind of has to be about him because you're building on him, right? Is, is he what you are consumed with? Um, Transitioning a little bit, and I'm going to come back to this idea of Jesus being the rock in a moment. But we're in a series talking about uh, doing the things that Jesus did. 
And so when I say that, what we're doing is we're taking an honest look at scriptures because we're, just, we're supposed to be little Christ, right, Christians. We're supposed to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, but not just because we're disciples, but because he tells us to. And so we're supposed to look at then, if, if I'm going to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, I need to get a handle on what did he do? What did he live like? What, are, what did he spend his time doing? And so that I need to do those same things. Uh, last week, I challenged you guys to... Um, one, study all the scriptures that you could find on Jesus healing people, and then also go pray for at least one person for healing out there, and got some amazing encouragements from some of you guys. Um, heard a testimony of a young woman who uh, shared with me that the person that she had ever prayed for the most in her life to be healed was her father, and her father wasn't healed. He passed away, and so she's had a lot of discouragement there and not wanting to do that but she pushed through it this last week and went and prayed for someone to be healed. Uh, someone that was at Walmart praying for uh, someone who had leukemia, and as they're praying for them, another person gathered, just a, just a stranger gathered, and started praying with them. And so not just having an impact on those that are sick, but on other people that are around. Um, this morning, I want to talk, and I want to approach this from a different way that we've ever approached it before. But this morning, I want to talk to you, and, or start talking to you, about spiritual gifts. And so you may say, like, well, what does that have to do with doing what Jesus did? Well, Jesus was the one that, that showed us really how to walk in the fullness of spiritual gifts. In the Old Testament, we see different people that are anointed by the Spirit of God and, and would walk in them from time to time. But when Jesus came, like, he's just really flowing in them, right? He is, he is words of wisdom, words of knowledge, healing, all these kind of things. Then he very clearly, through himself and through Paul, challenges the church to pursue um, love and yet earnestly desire spiritual gifts at the same time. So the church, guys, is supposed to be, the church is supposed to be strange in this way. The church is supposed to be strange that the world is chaotic, the world is falling apart, but the church is supposed to have power, supposed to have joy, supposed to be a place of, of hope, encouragement, people set free. Like, this should be the place, uh, Christians, believers, whether the church is gathering in your home or in here, but a place where people can come and, in a sense, escape the world and see what is true. But not just hear what's true, but to, to experience what is true. And to that end, through the Holy Spirit, God gives us spiritual gifts that we may do the things that Jesus did. And so I, I want to, again, approach it a little bit differently, but let me just say again, Jesus, by his submission to the Father, operated in spiritual gifts. We, it doesn't take very long to look at the scriptures to see that the disciples operated in spiritual gifts. And then it's very easy to, to come to the conclusion that he also tells us to pursue them, and that through a yielding, building our life on him and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, that we too can walk in supernatural abilities that God gives believers in order to fulfill his purposes. Let me say that again. Now, there, is, there are several things that we are to do in following Jesus, but spiritual gifts are supernatural abilities that God gives believers in order to fulfill his purposes. And that last part is key, in order to fulfill his purposes, not so that we can have goosebumps, but so that his glory would be shown, that people's lives would be changed, guys, to fulfill his purposes. God's desire is that the church should be the happiest, healthiest, most courageous place on the planet in spite of what's going on. And he's given us spiritual gifts to that end that we may accomplish that. So God desires to use you in supernatural ways. Through Scripture, we can determine that this is truth, guys. God desires to use you supernaturally. So do you believe that? Now, it's easy to believe sometimes about the person sitting beside you, but can you, do you believe that right now that God wants to use you in supernatural ways? And if you said yes to that, then that ought to be happening. Right? It's not enough just to like think, okay, yeah, that's true, Pastor. But it's, it's like, okay, then, then how is this, is this happening in my life? Um, so I want you to turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Of course, 1 Corinthians 12 through 14 are dealing with spiritual gifts. And, and I'll be coming back to this often this morning. But, but we need to look at spiritual gifts ultimately as closeness with God. Not as just some outpouring to... To, to see something, but as, as something God also uses to draw us close to him. 
Now, this first few verses are going to sound familiar in a way that we've discussed it, but we'll, we'll again, take a, kind of a different route in a little bit. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. And if you aren't familiar with spiritual gifts, then, guys, here goes a foundation for you. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware. So God, speaking through Paul, tells us that he does not want us to be unaware, uninformed, ignorant about spiritual gifts. We should understand them. We should spend time like digging into scriptures and looking at the stories, looking at the definitions, looking at these things, right? And I, and I always like to say when we read this verse, because I, I think it's important to say it, there are four different things that Paul tells us not to be ignorant of. Number one, Paul tells us don't be ignorant of God's plan for Israel. You can find that in Romans chapter 11. God tells us not to be ignorant about the devil's schemes, 2 Corinthians chapter 2. He tells us don't be ignorant about the end times events, 1 Thessalonians 4. And he tells us don't be ignorant of spiritual gifts. And we find that these are so many times actually four areas that we are ignorant about. And so he tells us don't be ignorant of these. In other words, understand them, study them. They matter. They're not some side issue. These are important things. Don't be ignorant of them. So don't be unaware. Don't be uninformed. Guys, if we are, if we are unaware that it's important to share the gospel, are you going to share the gospel? You guys here this morning? All right. If you're, if you're unaware of spiritual gifts and God's plan, you're not going to walk in them. So it takes knowledge and understanding in order to, to move forward. Verse 2 says, You know that you were pagans. When you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. In other words, don't let your past experience make you ignorant of spiritual gifts. And I realize that some of the church, your past experience with spiritual gifts kind of has built up a wall. But don't let what man's done keep you from experiencing what God has for you, right? So let's, let's don't worry about our past. Let's move into what is true. Verse 3, Therefore, I make known to you, and this is, this is where we're really going to focus this morning. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So as he begins talking about Holy Spirit, he, the spiritual gifts, he lays a kind of a, a teaching, a foundational thing here that, that the ultimate purpose of spiritual gifts, like everything else, is to glorify Jesus. Everything else is like, everything, else, everything that we do in life is, is about him. Let me read you John chapter 7. Oh, actually, I don't want to read that one yet. Uh, I'll come back to that. Romans eleven thirty six says this. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. So what does that mean? That means everything is from Jesus, everything is through Jesus, and everything is for Jesus. For his glory. So this includes spiritual gifts. They are all about his glory. So what Paul is teaching here is that it's, it's all about him, kind of a broad principle. This is about Jesus. Now, that may just seem like normal, like, yeah, I got that. But no, guys, do we get that whatever we're called to do and whatever we're supposed to do, that it is from him, through him, and for him? This goes back to that idea, is your life built on the rock of Jesus? Because it's, it's not enough for a church for us to teach on spiritual gifts and kind of send you out if your life isn't built on Jesus. It, it is more about a relationship than everything in Christ flows from relationship, everything. It, it is not a checklist. It's not religion. It's not do's and don'ts. It is, it is a relationship. So everything is about him, including operating in spiritual gifts. God is looking for people that have built their lives on the rock that he may pour out his spirit in great measure. Not some people that are just looking to turn it on when they want to see God move. The people that are living from this place of, I've built my life on the rock. So now John chapter 7, verse 38. It says, he who believes in me, so here's the foundation, right? He who believes in me, have you built your life on Christ? He who believes in, believes in me, as the scripture has said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the spirit whom those who believed in him were to receive, for the spirit was not yet given because Jesus 
was not yet glorified. So the verse, the verse part of 38, and we're just kind of going to build a case as we move through this this morning. The first part, before we talk about rivers of living water, and you've heard this verse, the, the Spirit being poured out on, it says, He who believes in me, he who has established his life on me, who has is, is, is built his life on me, and, and one of, again, the names of Jesus is the rock, right? We see this prophesied through and talked about throughout Scripture. And so I want to talk this morning about this idea of Jesus being the rock. I want you to read a, read a portion of Scripture with me, a prophecy in Isaiah 28, verse 16. Isaiah 28, verse 16. And here's kind of where, this is kind of the start of where we're wanting to go this morning. Isaiah 28, 16 says, Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a tested stone, a costly cornerstone for the foundation, firmly placed. He who believes in it will not be disturbed. How do you believe in a stone? Is he talking about a physical rock? No, he's, he's prophesying about who's coming. He's prophesying about Jesus. He says, if you believe in him, if you, if you build your life on Christ, on the rock, you won't be disturbed. Now let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. It says this, For I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud, and they all passed through the sea. He's talking about uh, the, the, the Jewish people in the Old Testament. And all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and they all dr- ate the same spiritual food. Listen to this. And they all drank the, the same spiritual drink, For they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them, and that rock was Christ. So here, Paul's talking about in the Old Testament, they drank water from a rock. Now, if you know the stories, we're going to read some stories about drinking water from a rock in just a minute. But he says very clearly that this rock was not just a rock. He says the rock was Christ. Right? They were drinking from a rock. There, were, there was rivers of living water, and they were drinking from Christ. Now skip down for just a moment to verse 11, because I think it's important to, to read this to understand the next couple of stories we're going to read. Now these things happened to them as an example that they were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Paul says, what happened to them was actually written for us, that we would understand what's going on right now in front of us. So in other words, everything that happens in the Old Testament, we'll combine some verses together, is about Jesus. Because everything is from him, everything is through him, and everything is to him. Right? So everything in the Old Testament is a picture of what is to come. It is of Christ. God was constantly painting a picture of, put your faith in my son, he is the Savior. Right? Build your life on him. He is this rock. He's not just prophesying about some rock out there, build your life on it. No, and Paul says here, we understand today that the rock that he was always talking about was Christ. And through this rock, the people were getting this, this living water. So there are two stories in the Old Testament where water actually comes literally from a rock. And those are the stories I want, to, I want you to read with me this morning. Exodus 17, verse 1. Exodus 17, verse 1. You guys with me? You need to stand up and stretch. We good? All right. Exodus 17, verse 1, the first story about water coming from a rock. So you got to know right here, they're in the wilderness, and the, the Israelites are complaining, right? God has done amazing things, but they're just complaining. It says, Then all the congregation of the sons of Israel journeyed by stages from the wilderness of sin. Hmm. It's funny, right? According to the command of the Lord, and they camped at Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore, the people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water that we may drink. And Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water. And they grumbled against Moses and said, why now have you brought us up from Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? They had no faith. They had no hope. They, had, they didn't trust the Lord. So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, What shall I do to this people? A little more, and they're going to stone me. But the Lord said to Moses, Pass before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand your staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. 
And behold, I will stand before you there on the, on the rock of Horeb, and you shall strike the rock. So you guys know the story, right? So what does Moses go and do? He takes the rod. He goes and strikes the rock. The rock splits, and water comes gushing out of the rock. But let's look at this story in the context of what Paul said. Paul said they were drinking from a rock, but the rock was Christ. So what do we know, first of all, about this story? So Moses has a staff, right? And this is this rod that he's supposed to, to go strike this rock with. What did the rod, what did the staff represent? Well, this is the rod that, God, that Moses had that he would use to bring about judgments upon, the, upon Egypt, right? He would use this rod and something would happen and a judgment would come. And so Moses, God tells Moses, I want you to take the rod of judgment and I want you to go hit this rock with it. And when you hit, who should he have hit with the rod? It's not a trick question. Who should he hit with the rod? It should have been the people, right? They're complaining and they're, God's doing all these kind of things and they're just not trusting in him. But he doesn't say take the rod and hit the people. Don't, don't put the rod of judgment on the people. I want you to take this rod of judgment and I want you to hit the rock with it. And so he takes the rod of judgment and he goes and he hits the rock and, and it, it splits and water becomes gushing out and this living water comes and God blesses the people. Paul is telling us here that this is Christ. And of course it is. It's a picture of him. The judgment that we deserve, we don't get. But God places the judgment we deserve upon Christ, upon the rock, and out of the rock comes rivers of living water for us, into us, and then out of us. Let's look at the next story, 40 years later, Numbers chapter 20. And of course, this is a picture of of Christ, of salvation. He takes the judgment that we deserve and, and, instead we, and then we get Holy Spirit from it. You see, all in the Old Testament, it's a picture of Jesus. Numbers chapter 20, verse 8. Let's read this story. Take the rod, Numbers 20, verse 8, so that, again, they don't have any water. They're thirsty 40 years later. He says, take the rod. Now, what we got to know is at this point in the story, no longer is Moses, the rod isn't referring anymore to the rod of judgment. There's a new rod. There's the rod of Aaron that budded. Remember, they kept it in the Ark of the Covenant. And um, it, was a miracle, it was a miracle rod, if you, if you say it this way. But the, this rod was not a rod of judgment. It was, a, it was Aaron's rod. It was the rod of the high priest. And so this is the rod that he's using now. He says, take the rod. So no longer a rod of judgment, but a rod of the high priest. And you and your brother Aaron assemble the congregation and speak to the rock before their eyes that it may yield its water. Now, he doesn't say strike the rock, right? He says speak to the rock. You shall thus bring forth water for them out of the rock and let the congregation and their beasts drink. So Moses took the rod before the Lord as he had commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly before the rock. And he said to them, listen now, you rebels. Shall we bring forth water for you out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand, struck the rock twice with his rod, and water came forth abundantly, and the congregation there be strength. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you have not believed me to treat me as holy in the sight of the sons of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. There's a, there's a whole lot here. We're just going to focus on one aspect of it. God didn't tell Moses to go strike the rock this time, right? And it's the rod of the high priest. It's not the rod of judgment. He tells him to go speak to the rock. Well, who's the rock? It's Jesus, right? So after salvation, we, we, we put our trust and faith in Christ. He doesn't have to get crucified again, right? I mean, he doesn't have to keep going through this. It is once and for all, for all time. But God is painting a picture here for us that, that once you are in Christ and you build your life on him as a rock, what you do is you speak. And what's speaking for us? If we're speaking to the rock, what is that? It's prayer, right? We, we connect with God through what has been poured out upon us. We connect with Jesus to build our life on Jesus, to receive the living water. We have to speak to the rock. They don't release water from the rock now by striking it. They release water by speaking, by calling upon it, by saying, if you would, Jesus, refresh us. 
living water, your spirit poured out. God, we not only need to be refreshed, we want to be used by you. We call on Jesus to release the water of life in us and through us. We don't get it by our own efforts. We get it through his efforts. It's all been done. We don't have to re-crucify him. It's, it's everything that we need. We sang about it this morning. Everything that we need is in him. Is your life built on Christ? This can mean a lot of things, and it can mean different things to, to different people this morning. If you are in Christ and you've been saved, you put your faith and your trust in him, is your life right now built on him? I'm not talking about what was your life like last week. I'm talking about whatever you're wrestling with, whatever you're struggling with, whatever lies or whatever you're doing, whatever sin, whatever. Can you say right now that your life is built on Christ? You are building up something on top of him. Are you yielded, submitted? Are you speaking to him? So again, before we're going out and we're saying like, Lord, pour out your spirit upon me that, that, that rivers of living water would flow, that, that signs and wonders and miracles would happen. Guys, it first starts with the relationship with him. I think sometimes in the church we've built up spiritual gifts and ministry to the point that it's, oh, I'm just supposed to go do this when the starting place is believe in me. Believe in me. Build your life on me. The problem is too many of us are building things right now not on Jesus. We're making decisions that are not built on the rock. We're making decisions about our life, about our marriage, about our kids, about finances, about ministry. We're building our lives on something that it wasn't him. And we're not calling upon him saying, Jesus, I, I need you in this place. And then, so what did Moses do? They had a need. He's good so far. They call upon the Lord. The Lord tells Moses what to do. And Moses doesn't do it. Guys, this is the life of the believer. This is building your life on a rock. It is calling upon the Lord and then doing whatever he says. And I'm not speaking right now primarily within the context of ministry. I'm speaking within the context of your heart. Is there forgiveness that needs to be given? Is there... Is there humility that needs to be displayed? Is there, is there honor? Is there, is there repentance? What, what needs to happen? If, if you're willing to call upon, guys, it's, it's not enough to call upon Jesus here. It is everything to obey whatever he says. And Moses, for whatever reason, it doesn't really tell us, didn't obey what Jesus said. And I think it's a picture of what happens in our, in our lives. Okay, I've got it. I, I'm going to call upon Jesus. But right now, if you called upon him about whatever is heaviest, whatever is going on in your life, are you willing to do whatever he says? And this is really where, this is what it all gets down to in the Christian walk, right? Are we willing to yield, surrender, build our life? On Christ, I'm going to give you four practical ways that we build our life on Jesus. We build our life on Christ by building our life on the Word of God. Guys, we live in a, we live in a time, in a, and it may be some of you in this room, we live in a time where we think we know better than the Word of God, and there's such rebellion even in the church to the Word of God, and that we know better than what it says. Or areas in our life that we don't, I'll tell you a big one. Um, I think it's a big one. When it comes to raising kids, do you raise your kids based on what the Word of God says or what somebody wrote an online story about that you have no idea who they are, if they even know Jesus or love Jesus, and you think it's a great way to raise kids, and so you're following their way? And your kid's a terror. Because we, we don't build our, our life on the word of God and what it says. 
when it comes to our marriages? Are we building our life on the, what the Word of God says? Do husbands lay down and love their wives the way that Christ loves the church? That's huge, right? How does Christ love the church? Sacrificially giving up himself for her, even though she's the one in the wrong. I'm not saying you ladies are wrong at all, but uh, that's what he did, right? Then continues to, to intercede on our behalf, coming back for us, never giving up on us. Number two, you build your life on the rock by, we've already said this, but you spend time calling upon Jesus. Guys, do you, do you, does everybody get this yet? Does everyone here get that you can't fix yourself and you weren't even meant to? It is God that changes us and transforms us. Now, he tells us the things to do, absolutely, but it's not coming up with some plan to, to change your life. It is calling upon the Lord to change you. Number three, you build your life on the rock, and this is very similar to what I just said, by realizing that you cannot do anything in your own power, whether it's personal freedom or ministry, that it is all him. Guys, everything is from him, through him, and to him. Do you feel like, if you, if you, like, if you feel like in your Christian walk, I've got this, then that's pride, and that's not even, it's actually a lie, it's not true. You don't got this. He's got this, so let's call upon him. And number four, I also kind of said this, you, you build your life on the foundation of Christ by yielding and surrendering to him no matter how difficult it is. Is there an area of your life right now that it would be difficult to obey the Lord, but can you do it? Are you willing? Unless you guys are just different than the rest of the world, there's a lot of people in here going through some major internal, emotional, mental turmoil. And are you willing to call upon Jesus and do whatever he says? So the next several weeks... We're going to be talking about spiritual gifts and, and understanding them so that, you know, the Bible says, Paul says, that we pursue love yet earnestly desire spiritual gifts. So it's just a really clear statement. The foundation is love, but we, how do you have a foundation of love? It's got to be in God, right? That's the only way you can have a foundation of love. But then you earnestly desire them and you, you, you understand them, you start walking in them. Um, we're going to be asking the Holy Spirit to pour out his gifts upon us, that we can be effective in doing what he's called us to do, to change the city and change the world, change our families, our, our own lives, the church. But guys, we start with building our lives on Jesus. For the rivers of living water to flow out, we've got to realize that it comes from the rock, and the rock is there for a clear picture. I build my life on it build your life on anything else, he tells us. The storms will come and it'll knock what you've built down. So we want to ask Jesus to pour out his Holy Spirit on us, but we want to build our life on him. Amen? Amen. So we're doing things a little bit different this morning, a little bit different order. We are going to take communion. So I'm going to ask the, the worship team to come up. If you guys would go ahead and make your way to the stage. And before we take communion, uh, I'm asking these guys if they would play Honey in the Rock for us again, because I want you to think about it now and sing it within the context of what we just talked about. And I want to ask you, is that your life? And gosh, do you ever feel like you just want to say something so bad and you just can't get it out? I mean, it's not that I don't, I'm willing to say anything, right? I just, I don't, can't say it. Don't, I don't have the words.
trying to think of the words. Um, Are you yielded and surrendered to Jesus? Are you willing to take whatever situation that is biggest in your life right now, ask him what he wants you to do, then do no matter what he says? Whether that's something exciting or something difficult, whatever it may be, are you willing to do that? 